All right. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, so since uh, Frank promised all kinds of things which I would talk about tomorrow, I ran out of stuff I could talk about today, so I uh, <laughs> slightly rescheduled. No, indeed, uh, what, what I decided is, so originally I wanted to talk about topological order, which I will do tomorrow. And the plan is to do a bit of PEPS theory today, because I realize that uh, not so much about PEPS has been taught, especially not about analytical aspects. Um, so my plan would be to, to talk about uh, a bit about the general structure of PEPS, analy analytical structure of PEPS, and then tomorrow we'll talk about topological order uh, specifically. So whenever you have questions, uh, interrupt me. I don't have a specific agenda. I just would like to uh, you know, convey some, some concepts about the general analytic structure of PEPS. Okay, um, so well, what are PEPs? It's a way of describing two-dimensional tensor networks. Um, so, well, we have two dimensions. I will most of, well, most of the time it's going to be exaggerated, but I will tend to uh, look at square lattices here. In some sense, that's not a restriction because we can always block any kind of two-dimensional lattice such that it looks square, right? On the other hand, we know that in many cases it makes sense to take into account the lattice structure, and we will actually see a couple of cases where it does make a difference how you look at the lattice. Um, but I mean, the general remark is that uh, well, square is easier to draw, right? But I, I don't want to make a statement that square is special in some sense. Uh, you should just kind of use whatever lattice suits your purposes best. In the end. So, well, what we want to look at is we want to look at spin systems. So each of these guys is some d-dimensional, small d-dimensional quantum system. And we want to express wave functions on these systems. Those things have been around. And the idea is that we want to express this, uh, well, expansion coefficient of the wave function um, in a way, well, as a tensor network, in a way which resembles a two-dimensional structure because we know that our system is governed by some local interactions, right? And uh, we're interested in, say, low energy states, ground states, and so on, which should kind of, in their entanglement, in their correlation structure, reproduce the structure of the interactions. So what we would do then is we would, um, take some four index tensors, sorry, five. So we would, we find some five index tensor A with indices I, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And we would arrange these guys in a two dimensional grid, right? So we have index contractions whenever we connect legs. And well, we could put this on a torus. We could choose some open boundary conditions where we will have to think how we terminate our system. We might look at infinite systems, or kind of half infinite in the sense that we might consider long cylind infinite cylinders, which have a finite diameter, but are very long. Um, with the infinite systems, um, you might actually ask if this is well defined with a thermodynamic limit. This is probably a subtle question, but you know, generally things uh, will work out fine. But you have to be careful, um, in principle at least. Um, okay, so. We have this physical dimension, small d. So this runs from 1 to d. And we have this virtual or auxiliary dimension, which runs from 1 to capital D, just to fix rotation. Um, there is a different perspective on these states, which also explains the name. Well, what does PEP stand for? PEP stands for projected intended pair states. What does this refer to? Well, it refers to an alternative construction which actually gives the same type of states. Um, so you could say, well, it's formally equivalent, but in some contexts, it's can be more convenient to think about things like that. What we do is we take maximally entangled states.
and we define some linear map from four indices to one index P. And the claim is that P is related to A in the following way. So it's a map described by, by this tensor A, which maps the four auxiliary indices to the physical index. And then what we do is we build a 2D grid of these states, these maximally entangled states. And then what we do is at each of these blocks we apply one of these maps P. And well, so what we do is we take entangled pairs and then we apply a linear map. Um, so you might wonder why it's called projected entangled pairs. Well, I guess the point is that a couple of interesting examples, these maps are actually projections, but there's no need to actually project. Right? The point is that you apply some kind of linear map to these things, um, which well, could project out degrees of freedom, it could also change weights of degrees of freedom here. And maybe in this picture, it's kind of more evident that these, de that these kind of guys really have to do with the entanglement in the system. Right? We really start from entanglement between adjacent sites, and then we can glue this entanglement together by applying these linear maps. Um, and well, this is actually completely equivalent to the formulation with tensor networks. <coughs> and the way to see it is basically to consider the most elementary gadget in this construction, like the smallest building block which is two of these maps connected by one entangled state. Because what you see that this, what is this entangled state? Well, this entangled state is basically a delta function between this degree of freedom and this degree of freedom, right? Because they have the same value. So what actually happens if you connect these two guys is that we have this gadget is something like P tensor P with some state omega applied to these degrees of freedom A and B. A has been used. So what we see that this omega exactly enforces the corresponding indices here, correspond to the right guy here and the left guy here to be equal and to sum over it, right? So this entangled pair basically just enforces the delta function. Everything clear so far? Okay. So that's kind of the canonical picture, but as I said, we could look at different lattices. We could build these states in different ways. And I will, I will be kind of flexible in the way I build these states, and I will ca call all of these guys PEPs. Also, well, let me just give some examples how we could try to re-express things. And well, it, it might sound like a triviality, but it can actually be very helpful to express things in different ways. It can be very helpful to express things in this picture rather than as tensor networks. It can also be very helpful to re-express things differently. For instance, is anything important? <laughs> for instance, uh, what we could do is um, we could take different entangled, pair, uh, entangled states, right? Different formulations, variants. So for instance, we could choose to, as an entangled state, let me draw this with squiggly lines, to choose a singlet, for instance, a spin one half singlet. This might be useful because we know for singlet that there are SU2 invariants. So if you want to build objects which have certain symmetries, it might be more useful to start from objects which have symmetries rather than to kind of afterwards you know, combine several non-symmetric objects in a way in which we get a symmetric object. So it might be a nicer choice. On the other hand, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, well, in the tensor network picture, what would that? So we could build well, the same kind of PEPs now with these singlets bonds instead of this delta type maximally entangled state. We could do the same thing if we build our tensor network 
by basically, instead of putting an identity, which was this delta type one, now putting some other matrix, which exactly encodes a singlet. So we could put here some matrix Y, which would be something like this, right? Because before there was an identity saying that this index and this are equal, which is this state. If we put this Y matrix, we would get basically a singlet state here. But you can also see now that you can, of course, immediately take this guy here and absorb it into this tensor and just declare this to be a new tensor. And we have this singlet everywhere, right? It's sitting here and here and here. So we should actually absorb both singlets, like two per side. We would get a new tensor, so we see that it's actually exactly equivalent to the original uh, way of expressing it. Or alternatively, the other way of seeing it is to say that we can take this guy here, which is a singlet, apply some unitary operation here, and we would get the other entangled state, that one, right? Basically, you have to apply exactly this matrix Y. So what we have is that Y times a singlet. Identity tensor Y times a singlet state is this omega, or maybe it's minus omega. I didn't check, but... Uh, I mean, you, you get the idea, right? Uh, which then means that we can take this y and just absorb it in this map, right? So we would redefine this map as first applying this y to two of the sides and then applying whatever the original map p was. And again, we're back to the original picture. There are other ways of expressing things which are not necessarily directly related. So for instance, what we could do is, um, we might get there later again, we could start from some tripartite entangled state. I might give an example later of such a case. And then we could arrange these guys in some way on a lattice, say like this. And then we would apply the same type of linear maps, but now only on two sides. So actually, you see what, what you get this way is a Kagome lattice, hopefully. Yes. So the yellow is only the Kagome lattice. Right? So you get a Kagome that way. And it can be that this is actually a much more natural way of expressing certain wave functions here on Kagome lattices. Now, you don't have entangled pairs anymore, but I conceptually also subsume these as, as projected entangled pair states, even though there are no pairs, right? So, so kind of the conceptual point is that basically, that basically what you do is you, that you have a wave function which you can write as a tensor product of some entangled states. So it's a product state, if you wish, right? But it has some kind of really purely local entanglement, followed by some maps, which are also in a tensor product, but they're a different tensor product, right? I mean, say the, the white entangled states are in this tensor product, and the map, of course, is exactly kind of dual to this tensor product because we want to build a complex entangled state, potentially. And that's kind of the the basic conceptual point usually that there is a way to relate this wave function into objects which are basically products, right, which don't have non trivial entanglement. And it's built up in, well, typically two stages, or whatever you want to call it, one stage, where we apply some map to these states. Again, you can take these guys, you can split up this entangled state here into a mini peps, if you wish, right? So you could, for instance, say you start from this guy here this tripartite state, and you write this as, well, putting bipartite entanglement, and then applying some map here. Now, we know this is always possible, right? Because, well, we could just, like, in, in a tensor language, singular value decomposition, or if you think more in a quantum information language, you know that you could, for instance, set up the whole state here and use this entanglement to teleport this parts of the state where they belong, right? 
So you could set up the whole state here, use this entanglement to teleport this part here, that one to teleport that part, and even ignore the entanglement here. And then you could, for instance, take these guys and, well, arrange them like here. So there. There would be a guy like this, right, and so on. And then we have to apply this next step, right? So what you kind of see that now, again, indeed, we're back in the normal picture. But we have just decomposed our map P into two layers. So in some sense, these are, of course, all simple transformations, but it can, in many contexts, be much more convenient to use one picture or the other. OK, so let me give some examples just to play a bit with these constructions. States, that's uh, I will not elaborate on that, right? But if we just don't use the bond degrees of freedom at all, if we don't use any entanglement, we can obviously get product states. Um, we can get things like GHC states. Very easy. So a state of the form all zeros plus all ones. With, well, Usually these things are not normalized, right? We don't have any reason to believe that, that a PEPS wave function will be normalized if we just construct it like that. Um, so, well, we anyway have to normalize afterwards, so I will not really care about normalizations. So well, how would we do that? Well, we can just define a tensor which is a, well, delta function, so it's one if i is equal to alpha equal to beta, equal to gamma, equal to delta, and zero otherwise. And now, of course, we see if we put this, say, on a, on a torus, um, what will happen is that this bond will just enforce that all these guys are equal, right? We're summing over all the virtual indices, and all the time, all the indices are, have to be equal. So the only two consistent configurations are this one and that one. And well, for open boundary sorry, for periodic boundary conditions, they will also have the same weight. For open boundary conditions, it will obviously depend on what boundary conditions we put, right? If we put a boundary condition which is our zero state, we will only get this component. Now, starting from here, we can build a, a more interesting class of wave functions, which uh, Frank already meant, well, not directly, but kind of mentioned, which are related to classical statistical mechanics models. And the point is that what, so given some classical Hamiltonian, which is a sum of local terms, say two body meters neighbor. And this is a classical Hamiltonian, right? So this is really a number for each value of Si and Sj. Um, then we can try to build a wave function, which is a, something like a coherence of a position of all states with a corresponding Gibbs weight. So what we have is we have like a coherence of a position of all configurations, and they have a weight which is kind of the square root of the Gibbs weight, but it's an amplitude, right? So the probability is actually the Gibbs weight. Which in particular means that whenever we compute correlation functions in the Z basis or anything in the Z basis, it will be exactly what we would also measure in a thermal state of that classical model. Which means we say, if we put the Ising model, know exactly what, we, what kind of correlations and so on we will have in this model, right? Is, is there any meaning to measuring in a different basis, like it's classical? Um, I'm sure, yeah. Um, Should be kind of some responses to spin flips, no? I suspect like susceptibilities. What? 
What was the question? The question is what happens if there's an interpretation to have, say, measurements in the X basis of these guys rather than the Z basis, which there probably is, right? So, but it's, I think it's some kind of response-like thing, right? Because basically what you have is that, um, well, you have one correct Gibbs weight and one wrong Gibbs weight, so to say, which you combine, because one spin has been flipped. So it's kind of off by, by one of the Hamiltonian terms. So you're probably computing something like the expectation value of a specific Hamiltonian term or things like that. Yeah. It's more typically what happens once you put complex uh, observables and so on. <laughs> and I'm sure you can at least partly interpret these things indeed also in the classical standard picture. But in, I mean, I'll go through construction in a second, but in, indeed one of the points is that this will indeed tell you, for instance, that you can have PEPs wave functions which have critical correlations. Right, because you know that the Ising model, right, basically all stuff like models have some critical uh, uh, point. It also tells you that by continuously varying a parameter in the Hamiltonian, which, like the temperature, sorry, like the temperature, uh, you can actually kind of cross a phase transition. So you can have PEPs which, by continuously changing some parameter in the, in the ansatz, undergo a phase transition and show different behavior like symmetry plating, etc. So that's more the idea. But indeed, I guess you can also work out what happens in some other places. But also, it's a bit weird because this, when you have a double layer, this has a bottom measure of four. Mm -hmm. But the classical IC model can be written on the bottom. Let, let, let me first explain the construction, yeah, yeah. and then I will uh, <laughs> briefly say something about this point. So, so how does the construction work? Ah, Frank is already clarifying the point. <laughs> um, so how does the construction work? Well, we basically start from this tensor. I mean, what do we do? I mean, we, we, we take this expression, we rewrite it. So we take the exponential and decompose it. And that's, of course, possible because it's a classical Hamiltonian, so all these guys are commuting. So we can just write it as a product. So what we want to make sure is basically that each two adjacent guys get a relative weight depending on their value, which is exactly given by this exponential function here. So what we do is we build a tensor network where we keep taking these delta tensors here from before. And when we connect them, we put some matrix M here. And what this matrix M does, well, we have some spin value i here, right, and some spin value j here. Well, it's s i actually, s j. It should give those guys a relative weight depending on s i and s j, right, which is exactly given by this uh, contribution. So this matrix should basically be like this, right, and so on. So again, what you see is that you, in principle, allow for all configurations here, but you give them a weight, which is exactly given by the Gibbs factor for this two-body interaction. And again, in some sense, this is a way of writing a PEPs where we, now we have a bond, which is non-trivial in some sense. It's maybe not maximally entangled. Right? So we put an extra tensor on the, on the bond indices. But of course, again, what we have is we have this M everywhere. So we could, for instance, define this by taking some tensor B, which is defined as this A, and then the square root of this matrix M. <coughs> we could also define it in a non hermitian way, right? Might be easier, might be harder, depending on what you want to do. Um, but, but there are clearly different ways of, of, of absorbing that and just getting a normal tensor network without kind of intermediate objects. So uh, to get back to your question, uh, so what, what happens if we compute expectation values here? Well, if we compute expectation values, you have to take the cat and the bra and combine them, right? And then contract the whole tensor network. So let's look at one of these elementary objects. And well, the A is again this delta tensor, and then we have the square root of M sitting here, right? And so on. Now, for the Ising model, this has one dimension two, right? Or generally, that's a dimension of the Sutnik model. So if we look at these two indices together, indeed, this has a dimension B, this has a dimension B. 
So it's d squared if d is the number of settings. On the other hand, because it's a delta tensor, we know that whatever value s and s prime we have here and there, they must be equal, right? s is equal to s prime. And after that, of course, we apply this map. But this map, except at temperature zero, maybe is always an invertible map, right? So it will not change the dimension of this space. So what this is saying at this point, we're in a two-dimensional subspace. And we just apply some map, so we're still in this two-dimensional subspace, so we can just compress it. We could apply an isometry, which maps everything to a 2D subspace. Right? So we could apply some isometry V here, and then we're back to this D-dimensional or two-dimensional space for the isometry. So there is some redundancy in the description, which indeed, for these kind of wave functions, which are set up by hand, which are very special, there are often kind of redundancies which allow you to do computations more efficiently because if you combine cat and bra, you don't use all degrees of freedom. So in those cases, it's certainly important to check for such things. But the other hand, it's true that if you compute off-diagonal terms, Say again? So, so if you compute the expectation value of sigma x, for example, that's not true anymore? Yes, but only locally, right? I mean, indeed, if you do string operators, you have to be a bit more careful. I mean, if you do x, it's still true, but it's a different compression, right? Yes. But you see, it, it's, it's only seen by the next, it's not even seen by the next neighbor, right? Because the point is, whenever you don't put an operator, you can put this isometry as a resolution of the identity. So you see, if there's one tensor here, which, is, which has an operator here, you can kind of still hit it from that side with this isometry. So you only have to be careful if, say, you have a nearest neighbor interaction and you want to compute the expectation value of x tensor x nearest neighbor, then indeed you cannot use that compression. Then the result will be completely wrong. So you have to be careful if you compress indeed. You can't just start computing expectation values somewhere. I've made this mistake, so I guess. <laughs> is, the, is the V also again just a delta function? A what? Well, the, the V is a delta function here, right? Here, yeah. Now, uh, if, so if you do the square root of m, you have to basically transform it under this m. Okay. But that is, I mean, this space is not even unique, obviously, right? It's an asymmetry. Unitary degree of freedom. Yeah, you but in some way, you have to dress it with this m. And then, indeed, these vectors are not orthogonal anymore, like the 0 and the 1 vector. So the s on it, well, it's q, it's q the s on it. So in that sense, it's kind of easier if you apply it here and then uh, you put the m on one side. So the norm of the, uh, I mean, the, the product of the wave function with the sum. Is that the partition function? That's a partition function, indeed. That's what Frank was saying, basically, that you can have a tensor network which computes partition functions. And indeed, I mean, if, if you go through it, say, for the Ising model, you will get exactly the transfer operator of the Ising model if you do this compression, right? This will tell you that exactly this expectation value, this object is exactly isomorphic to the transfer operator of the Ising model. So you can use all kinds of tools to, to compute things. In the general case, if you know you have only like your Pepsoni supported normal subspace of your species. How do you actually find this B? Well, you can do it numerically or by thinking, no? That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> numerics might also require thinking, but... Uh, no, I, I, mean, I mean, numerically it's simple, no? You just build this uh, object here. It just looks for zero. Which is like, say, a double index tensor E, and then you do an SVD in that cut. Or you might first block two sides and look for an SVD. It might, it might also work. Like in many cases, you can also see it analytically. If there's an advantage of doing it analytically, I don't know because the SVD is, uh, you only have to do it once, right? And it's probably still very accurate. Is the parent Hamilton in at this state like a nice thing or is it? Of the, well, I still wanted to get to parent Hamilton yeah. later. <laughs> um, the simplest parent Hamilton is five body. <coughs> so it basically acts on a, but I'll, I'll talk about it hopefully later today, but it acts on like, like that shape. Because you see, once you fix the value of these four spins, the spin in the middle, if, if everything is given by a Gibbs weight, is completely determined. In the sense that it's a superposition of up and down with a Gibbs weight given. Like once you freeze these guys to classical values, this guy is completely determined. So you can write a Hamiltonian which forces it to be exactly in that, in that superposition given by the Gibbs weight of these four interactions. But uh, we should get there later. But well, let's see. <laughs> Well, it's good if you guys ask questions. Um, okay. So this really tells us that, say, we can have critical correlations in two-dimensional Pep's wave functions, right? Something which we cannot have in one dimension. In one dimension, we either have like infinite correlation length, like a GHZ state, which is kind of very artificial, so to say, 
or we have we have a finite correlation length and exponentially decay correlations. And in 2D, it's certainly possible to get systems with critical correlations. Now, it's not entirely clear how fine-tuned that is. I don't think we have a good general statement if you would randomly create a, a PEPs wave function, what kind of correlations it should exhibit. On the other hand, you might not want to create random wave functions anyway. Okay. Mm. What other examples do we have? AKLT model. Um, has that one the AKLT model been discussed uh, at some point? Yes. Uh, yeah, I showed one slide with it. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Actually, to come back to the, to the question about the sigma x, yeah. uh, using this pattern of Hamiltonian, you can see that actually the expectation of sigma x is equivalent to a five body expectation value in the original classical statistical diagram. Is that so? Yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay, um, whoever wants to know the details, we can discuss it afterwards. No, but I, th I think it's true, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not possible. But it's not a general statement. No, I mean, you you can compute general expectation values which cannot be mapped to this basis. Probably. No. Everything can be mapped to this? Ah, okay. Hmm. Okay, that's uh, good to know. Um, Okay, I, I just give the AKLT model because it's good to have uh, to have seen it, and it, it has some nice symmetry properties. Uh, I will not discuss much about it. We will see it later briefly. So the AKLT model is built from well, we have two spin one half systems, so d is equal to two, and we start from a singlet state here. And what we do is we arrange this on some lattice, and now let's take for a change a honeycomb lattice. We'll see later that honeycomb has some advantages. Is this a honeycomb? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in the end, you have a pentagon and people complain. So it's it's a, that's one of the big risks of giving blackboard talks on text. You have to draw all these pictures, which are slightly <laughs> tedious. Um, okay, so what we have is we have, we have this uh, hexagonal grid of singlet states, and then our map, which we apply. So what does that map do? Well, this map is defined on three spin one halves. So these three spin one halves have, well, if we tensor it out, a uh, spin one half space, another spin one half space, and a spin three half space, if I'm not mistaken. And what we do is that we project onto the spin three half space. So this is a projection onto spin three half, or differently speaking, it's a projection of the symmetric subspace. And what we obtain this way is an, a, a, a rotationally invariant, so SU2 invariant wave function. And it's simple to see that we get this, because what did we do? Well, we started from an initial state which was SU2 invariant, namely singlets, or a tensor product of singlets, I said from a tensor product of singlets. And then we apply these projections onto a subspace with a definite spin, namely 3 half. And again, this map commutes with the SU2 representations, right? Because it just selects a certain spin sector. So what this map P will do is that P, indeed, if we take the spin 3 half representation, it will commute with it and have three spin 1 half representations here. And right? it's just constructed to be like that. So indeed, what we see is that whenever we take this wave function and we apply some symmetry operation here, it will commute through this P and become the spin one half symmetry uh, transformation, which then is absorbed by the singlet because it's invariant, right? So we get an invariant wave function. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll meet this later on. It has a couple of nice properties. For instance, it's a, it's a ground state, a unique ground state for two-body Hamiltonian. Okay, let's, let's do one last example, which is again actually a construction of an SU2 invariant wave function, but a very different one. Um, maybe a 
the so-called resonating balance bond state. Now again, we can do some different lattices. Let, let me just do it on a square lattice, but we could do it on cover me, in fact. Um, it's just a bit hard to draw, so I, I prefer to. So what, what is the RDB state? So we have a square lattice. And on each lattice side, we have a spin one half sitting. And now this is a wave function where what we do is we make pairs of spin one halves, kind of dimers of spin one halves. And we put those into maximally entangled states, singlet states. So each of these guys is again a spin singlet, just like here. And we, we really take a full covering of the lattice, right? There are no free spins. All spins are in some singlet or some nearest neighbor. And now we take a uniform superposition of all these configurations, right? All coverings. So the idea that this is kind of hopefully a good answer for Heisenberg type models, because singlets are good for one Heisenberg interaction and making them into superpositions is, if the phases are right, good to decrease the interaction also for kind of the other Heisenberg interactions, right? But that we can't really. Well, this is not good. No, it's, it's also not true that it's always a good answer. That's the other thing indeed. But uh, well, well, you can dope it and it's actually not so bad. You can put some, some broken spits. Anyway, um, but I think the historical perspective for, for RBBs is indeed to have, if you have Heisenberg type interactions, that it should be a good ansatz. But indeed, it depends on the lattice and other things, right? So it's, it's not a universal tool, it's more intuition. So, how can we build these things? Well, um, what we want is that on the one hand, we are able to put singlets on each link, so our bond should provide the entanglement for the singlet. On the other hand, we have to also coordinate where we put singlets, right? So we need to pass this information as well. Now, intuitively, we can't really use a singlet to give you a freedom to, in addition, communicate if there is a singlet or not, right? Because it's a different type of information, right? So, so we, what we should do is we should kind of add an extra degree of freedom for saying if the singlet is not being used. So what we do is we have some entangled state like that, which one has a singlet. And then we give it an extra state, a third level, so our D will actually be 3. And this 2 state is kind of a no singlet tag. So basically the idea would be that on a bond like this one, we have a singlet, we use the degrees of freedom in the subspace 0, 1 to actually put a singlet there. And on the other hand, if we're in a situation like here where there's no singlet, we would use a two state, kind of on the entanglement degree of freedom, on the bond, to signal that we haven't used the singlet, that there shouldn't be a singlet. So the idea would be that our map, which we apply at each side, should on one of these guys pick the 0 or 1 subspace and identify it with the actual physical spin we want to put. And the other guys should be projecting onto this two state. <clears throat> so the map would be of the form So that's one of the terms, say this term should be like that, where we pick the 0 or 1 from the left. But then, of course, the signal should be able to come from any direction. So we add well, all the other configurations. And so on, right? So we choose a 0 and 1 from each of the four possible positions. And where we don't choose it from, we put a 2. Which means what? Well, which means that, say, if this is on the left and on the adjacent, there's an adjacent guy, we have this bond here. And well, if we choose to map the 0, 1 subspace out here, the other side will automatically be also projected into that subspace, right? 
because zero one is connected with zero one here. So this guy will also have to take the zero one state here, which means that indeed these two guys will share the singlet here, this part of the singlet. And the other sides then have to project onto this two state, which again, if there's a two state here, this information is shared by this bond, right? So if there's a two state up here, it must be in this two state up here and down there. So indeed, you get a consistent pattern, right? And again, every consistent pattern of singlets will have the same amplitude in this picture. So you indeed get all superpositions. Now we will meet these kind of uh, wave functions actually tomorrow again. But one interesting thing about this is that it's actually also an SU2 invariant wave function. From a physical point of view, that's easy to see, right? It's the superposition of singlets, and each of these singlet configurations is SU2 invariant. So that superposition is also SU2 invariant. Um, so how can we, can we see that it's maybe also kind of because each building block is SU2 invariant? And the answer is yes, because in fact this whole object is again a singlet for the zero plus one half representation. Sorry, for that. More precise, one half plus zero representation. Right? So on the zero and one state, we act with a spin one half representation. And then this is a singlet, obviously, right? For this one half representation. And this one corresponds to a spin zero representation. And there, of course, it's I mean, like a product, I mean, it's obviously also invariant because the spin zero representation acts trivially. So this whole object is indeed a singlet for this kind of combined, not irreducible representation. And again, this P has exactly the same property. It's again a change of representations. Like you can just indeed work out that if you apply this one half representation to P, you can instead, uh, instead put um, well a fourfold product of this uh, one half plus zero representation. Okay, let's get the top of Okay, questions? So is this the same state as the uh, RK the RVV at the RK point? It's not a diamond model. It's not a quantum diamond model. That is actual singlets. You could make a diamond model out of that in different ways, right? Um, I don't think that's a canonical way because I think people never really talk about local limit spaces when they talk about diamond models. At least that's a, the, the way I usually read these things. Um, I mean, you, you can make a diamond model out of it. What you want for a diamond model is that different configurations are orthogonal states, different signal configurations. Now the point is actual single configuration on orthogonal, right? Because if I put a single like that and I have a lattice, uh, I take this state here, say, and say everything is the same, maybe, and then I take another configuration, which is like that. These guys will have a finite overlap, right? right? They will not be orthogonal because it's just kind of a loop of singlets. For the diamond model, you want orthogonal singlets. There are different ways of doing that. One way of doing that would be to build this map here in a way where you actually keep the information where you took your singlet from. So at each side you could add a four level system, which is kind of like a wheel which points into one of these four spins, if you wish. So you just keep this, right? So you would tensor this guy with a zero, this guy with a one, and so on, and two and three. And this would be a diamond model indeed, at the arcade point. One nice thing indeed in this language is that it gives you a way to continuously come, go from an arcade point to such a point like this one, which is not much less nice, right, because these configurations are not orthogonal, by kind of slowly interpolating between a map where you have this information, which is a diamond model, and a map where you don't have this information. Like you, can, you can take four states here, and you can make them equal or orthogonal, or you can like slowly make them more and more equal. And this would be, at least in a local way, a locally continuous interpolation between these models. And that's indeed one way to understand, say, in the Kagome case, when you magically check that um, the Kagome RVB is in the same phase as the diamond model. Okay. So what's the 
plan. That, okay, so, so the idea would be to talk about uh, injectivity, which has come up uh, earlier, um, which is an important concept which, which allows us to uh, make stronger statements about the structure of these wave functions. Uh, and then the related to Hamiltonians. Before I talk about injectivity, let me just remark that we can, of course, in PEPs, just like an MPS block uh, thing. So if we have a patch of a tensor network of, say, size 2 by 2 and some bond dimension d, we can redefine this and define this to be a new tensor, which now has some bigger index, right? Now, we just block these guys here. So we get a dimension d squared here, and the physical dimension becomes d to the 4. And of course, it in principle still has the same structure as before. So it might be more convenient sometimes to look at block tensors because they're easier to describe. In other cases, it might make sense to not block too much because you're gathering too many degrees of freedom. So one has to be careful. But for now, because I'm interested in the general mathematical structure, I will allow for blocking. But of course, it, again, it, it might make sense to break these blocks down again later because you want to know what a single spin does and not what a block of 5 by 5 spins does. So what is injectivity? Kind of, kind of hand-wavily speaking, is injectivity tells you that by looking at the physical degrees of freedom in a tensor network, you can fully access the entanglement degrees of freedom, the virtual degrees of freedom. There is no hidden uh, uh, information or hidden degree of freedom in the entanglement which you cannot access. You really can gain access to all the entanglement degrees of freedom. Now, the problem of which you have to be careful is that, in the first place, it tells you that mathematically you get access to these guys, which might not, it might not be the same as saying that physically you can get access to these guys. And what do I mean by that? We will see it maybe a bit, uh, in a bit more detail later. But physical operations have to be unitary, basically, right? Whereas mathematical operations, if I have a linear map which gives me access to whatever degree of freedom I want, that's fine for certain mathematical proofs. But it might not be good enough for a physical application in some sense, or for things where I want to put a physical meaning into it. Because I'm restricted to things which have, say, some finite success probability, or which are unitary or so. Right? So, so basically, it says we can access all entanglement degrees of freedom by acting on the physical system. So formally what it says, uh, if we have this map P here, the formal point would be that to say that P has a left inverse, which means that if we apply P inverse P, we get the identity on the virtual system. Or differently speaking, if I have some pep square function, what it tells me is that I can act on some guy in the middle. Right? I mean, there's, there's currently a map being applied, right, which completely disguises uh, uh, the virtual indices, potentially. Injectivity tells me I can apply a map here, which gives me direct access to these entanglement degrees of freedom. There's no physical leg here. Sorry? There's no physical leg here. Oh, I mean, I mean, there are all these. I mean, I mean when I draw the circles, I mean, I'm applying some, some linear map, which, which well, oh, projects. Okay, yeah. Well, not projects in this case, because then you couldn't invert it. But maps the... Uh, the okay. entanglement pairs, right? I mean, I'm not in this, I'm, I'm in this PEPS picture, no, not in the tensor network picture because it's kind of, in some sense, I find it a bit easier to explain in this picture. But usually what you do is you have these four ends of these four entangled pairs here, and you apply a linear map, and maps this to your physical system. Okay. And now if you have this left inverse, it means you can act on this physical system and get back these four guys. So you could just remove this linear map here, right? 
And now you can keep iterating that and do it everywhere. And what this tells you is you can take the original PEPs and map it to just entangled states, right? So just a grid of entangled states with nothing else. Now, now one point, of course, is that um, if you take any of the examples I described, this will not be the case on a single site, just by kind of dimensional counting. Right? Because what you see is that, of course, P is a map from, well, four degrees of freedom here to the physical degree of freedom. Right? So what you need is that the physical degree of freedom must be larger or equal than D to the four which clearly for all these examples doesn't hold, right? I mean, even if capital D is one half, sorry, it's two, it's been one half, um, you already need a 16 dimensional system, right? So the point is, of course, that you have to block for that, right? Typically. Because what happens when we block? Well, when we block, we block a block of length L, then we see that the new virtual, the new bond dimension becomes d to the l, because we block l sides, and the new physical dimension becomes d to the l squared. Right? So this equation becomes d to the l squared is larger or equal than d to the 4l. So you see that if you increase l, you very quickly reach a point where this equation will be satisfied. And then in some sense, you expect that if you have taken some kind of a random, some generic PEPs, that it will indeed have this left inverse, right? Because any random map will have maximum rank, the maximum rank it can have, right? OK. So I already sketched kind of what the point of injectivity is. The point is that we can take our PEPs wave function and relate it to this kind of bare skeleton of entangled states without any perhaps uh, like projection map applied to it. So let me, let me try to formalize this a bit. And we will see in, in, in a moment that when we talk about Hamiltonians, this is actually an extremely powerful concept, but it's also in some other aspects a very powerful concept. So what we have is that we had this PEPs wave function, which we defined as, um, well, a product of linear maps applied to some grid of intended states omega. So what, what this tells us is we can start from this grid of entangled states. And from there, by applying these maps p, we can go to our PEPs wave function. Right? That always works. That's just steps. Right? The construction. Now, injectivity tells us basically that we can go back, right? That we can take psi, we apply the tensor product P inverse, and we get back omega. So this tells us we can also go the reverse way. And this is what injectivity tells us. And, and maybe you can already feel that, that this is kind of a very strong statement because it tells us that this and this is structurally the same in some sense, right? They should kind of behave the same way because, you know, whatever holds here, we can map it back here and vice versa. So there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? I mean, I, I, will, I will be a bit more concrete with that, but maybe you can kind of see that, that one, one could try to do arguments that you construct something here, you map it to here, but then you can also go back, so there must be whatever you, whatever you can pull through this construction must have a one-to-one -one correspondence between this very simple pure entangled state and this wave function you constructed. But then all the physics will be this physics or probabilities. No, 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 that's why I said mathematically. It's, it's a bit subtle in me, as you can see, right? Because, I mean, well, I, I haven't checked it that certain things are injective, but if you imagine that these stud Macmillan wave functions are injective, which they are, on, say, honeycomb lattices, or if you treat them the right way. Um, 
then indeed you see that these static models can have different phases, but they can all be mapped to a product state. So it tells you that you have to be careful, and that's indeed related exactly to this fact of the mathematical mapping, but it can become highly non-unitary at some point, so you might still lose some physics. So indeed, in some sense, some, some point about this map is, of course, that you can start to take this map P, which has injectivity property, and try to continuously continuously go from one to the other. Right? So you build a map P of lambda such that P of zero is the identity, which just means that your state is just this wave function here. And P of one is the P you actually want. And if this map is invertible, and if you do it in a smart way, you will find an interpolation, which is also invertible the whole time. So then it really tells you that you can kind of smoothly go along this whole path in a way which is locally continuous, right? And build some interpolation between these models, and then say numerically, for instance, study if you will encounter a phase transition there. And I mean, you have to do it numerically, right? Because we know we can put classical Stuttgart models in this picture, and we know that except for the Isaac model, we can't solve these models usually. So it's, it's kind of clear that you cannot make a pure mathematical statement about, uh, say, things like phases or phase transitions, given that statmet models generally are not solvable analytically. OK, let me give a few examples about injectivity, states which are injective, and states which are not injective, but by um, dealing with them the right way can be made injective. Uh, oops. Mm. So which states are injective? So for instance, if we take one of these StatMec models on our honeycomb lattice, let me draw these as tensor networks now. <coughs> so there's some outgoing indices. Right, so, so injectivity in, in, in the sense of a tensor network means that whatever boundary conditions you put here, that different boundary conditions get mapped to different physical conditions, right? I mean, why is it called injective, right? I mean, the existence of a left inverse is equivalent to the fact that the map is injective, right? So there, nothing is mapped to zero. So indeed, it's saying that whatever condition I put here, I want I to whatever vector I put here, it should never be mapped to zero. Or conversely, that for any configuration here, I can find a physical configuration. If I project on that one, I will get whatever configuration I want at the boundary. Now, these statmet models are kind of defined by having delta tensors and having this uh, M here. And I should have square root of M's on these bonds. But M is invertible, right? So uh, if I'm interested in if there exists a left inverse, I can omit the fact that the kind of concatenate with an invertible map, right? And what you see now is that the point is the following. I have a physical index here. I have this index here. And they're actually equivalent equal, right? So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between whatever I put here and whatever I see here, except that the amplitudes are different. And of course, if I would go to zero temperature, right, it could be that certain spin configurations on the hexagon are completely forbidden. And then I would lose injectivity. So indeed, if I go to zero temperature, I would lose injectivity because certain Say I would get a ferromagnet here. Then, of course, boundary conditions, which are not ferromagnetic, would be annihilated. But at any finite temperature, any configuration has a non-zero probability of existing, right? So nothing will be annihilated. Every configuration I put here will be just appear here again, just with some different weight. Which means there's indeed a one-to-one -one correspondence between the entanglement degrees of freedom and the physical degrees of freedom once I go to a hexagon. And then, indeed, it tells you you can take this and map it 
to, well, whatever intended pair pattern you have once you remove single hexagons, which is some kind of triangular lattice in the end. So turns out the AKLT is also injective. Um, there's actually a very nice argument if you understand the structure of the AKLT state. So if you want to think about it, it's kind of fun. Otherwise, you can test these things on the computer. Right? You can just program this map and test if it has full rank. Then you know it's injective. So AKLT is also on a single hexagon. Okay, let me skip that. So what about on the square lattice? Say again? What about on the square lattice? Okay, then I don't skip it. <laughs> I wanted to skip the square lattice, but it's actually a very interesting point. Um, okay, so, so indeed, the point is the square lattice. We could try to do the same and ask, do we have this injectivity property, say, for stuck neck models on the square lattice? And what happens there? So let's, let's assume we take, say, a two by two block or whatever on the square lattice. Right, we might have to block. We saw it here, right? We need like a block of one hexagon to get this invertibility because of this counting of the keys of freedom. So let's say we take this guy, we have these M matrices in the setback case. And now we ask, is there a way to access all the degrees of freedom here by acting on the physical degrees of freedom? But now you have something that's I, alpha, beta here, which are equal, right? This was a delta tensor. So obviously the space where alpha is not equal to beta is, is inaccessible. Because alpha is always equal to beta, right? All configurations that are not equal are annihilated. So you might say that that's very bad because it kind of uh, takes away these tools which we have to, to maybe relate a wave function to just a product state. But the point is it's not so important what the state is, right? As I already said in the beginning, the conceptual point is that I start from some product state of small entangled states and apply a map. It doesn't matter so much what the state is for many of the tools. So what we can do in this case is, so originally we had this construction of physical index, we put these m's here. And each of these m's assured that kind of the statistical weight along this bond was correct. But we could do it in a different way. We could, for instance, do the following. We could take our square lattice. So let's just uh, sketch the lattice. And so what we want is that we could, for instance, take these four guys and say, let's put an object in the middle, which assures that all these four Hamiltonian terms here are accounted for in the right way. And then we put something here, which kind of tries to take care of these Hamiltonian weights, and something here, which takes care of these. And you see you get all Hamiltonian weights in this way. So what do we have to put? Well, basically, what we have to put is we have to put some, some four index tensor here which gives the Gibbs weight of all the four Hamiltonian terms on one plaquette rather than just on one link. And then we put the same thing here. And here we just have this delta tensor as before. And now you can indeed see that you have this injectivity if you block one of these guys. And the argument is exactly the same as before, right? That this guy is identical to this index, this is identical to that index, and so on. And because at non-zero temperature, this matrix has full, is full, like all entries are positive, there will indeed be a one-to-one -one correspondence, except for the amplitudes. So what you see is you can take out these guys here, everywhere, and you, you remain with kind of a factorized grid of these four perturbed entangled states. And again, for many of the proofs, you can do the same things especially relating to Hamiltonians and so on. Okay, what? Okay, there, there are two, two, two points why injectivity is very important. One is standard forms and transformations between, like, like representation of symmetries on the entanglement. The other one is Hamiltonians. For Hamiltonians, this works equally well. For symmetries, indeed, uh, it's important how we define injectivity, so this will not work as well. So let me just kind of briefly state the result for, uh, for symmetries. Oops.
And now really, I mean injectivity in the narrow sense. I mean, not kind of getting funny in tangled states, but really just uh, getting bipartite kind of things. Frank, you look amused. <laughs> no? It's no. unrelated to my... Uh, yes. Okay, I thought maybe I said something uh, particularly ridiculous or so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so let's say... With, so the, the main theorem here is the following. Let's say we have an injective PEPs built from some tensor A. And we have a second tensor B such that the PEPs built from some tensor A is equal to the PEPs built from some tensor B. So we're assuming some translation symmetry. And let's say we have this injectivity condition really in the sense that if we put this on a normal lattice with normal entangled states, we can open these indices up. Then injectivity implies that A and B are locally related. Right? So we have two wave functions that, which are globally equal. And we want to know, is it a local way to relate them in the sense of relating the tensors which build them? And the claim is that in that case, B can be obtained from A by some gauge transformation, x, x inverse. and y, y inverse. And you see, of course, the opposite direction is completely clear, right? The opposite direction is saying that if a and b are related in that way, they describe the same wave function. And this is obviously true, right? Because if you, if you contract a tensor network built from b, you can use these guys, and you will always have x meeting x inverse when you contract links. So you can just cancel x with x inverse, and you just get a network built from a rather than from b. So this always works, and this does not hinge on injectivity. The point about injectivity is it tells you that it's the only way in which they are related. Right? Whenever you have two tensors which describe the same wave function, they must be related in that way. So it kind of tells you that this is a complete picture. Right? You're not missing anything if you assume this relation for things which are equal. Would the gauge transformation also be an NPO? Like no. No, why not? Not if it's injective. Honestly. It happens if it's injective with corners, actually. So the CZX state of Janet L is indeed, well, it's just a product state, but it has this kind of corner problem, right? So, so you have these plaquette states you put, and then indeed we know that they're physical symmetries, and a physical symmetry is a particular case where you have wave functions which are the same, um, which are represented as MPOs. So in that case it can happen, yes. But if you inject it, that's exactly the point, right? There are no MPOs. You don't have to think about MPOs. Which of course makes it very uninteresting for fun. But yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, 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 so why is this interesting? Well, one particular point why it's interesting is if we have a wave function with a symmetry, and we want to know what is the most general way in which we can encode the symmetry in the wave function. So say you might have a local, global, whatever you call that symmetry. You have a wave function which should be invariant under some unitary apply to every side. Now applying a unitary to every side exactly means that you want to take A and apply this unitary here, right? And that's a tensor describing the left-hand side of the equation. And now what we, what we know is that then the tensor for the left-hand side must be related to the tensor for the right-hand side, which is just A again by some gauge transformation. And now we can ask, for instance, say if U forms a representation of some group, what do we know about X and Y? And well, they also have to form a representation because they are unique in fact, right? X and Y are unique. They must also form a representation. It might be a projective representation, because indeed the phase of x is not even well defined, but everything else is well defined. Um, so we, for instance, see that x and y form projective representations in that case. We could do similar things if, say, we have inflection symmetry or something like that, or time reversal, right? Say we have time reversal. So we have that psi a conjugate is equal to psi of a, say. We might combine it with a physical spin flip or whatever. Then we get a very similar equation, namely if we take a and complex conjugated, which is a tensor for the complex conjugate wave function, it again has to be related by such a gauge transformation.
Okay, so um, this is very powerful because it allows us to kind of fully understand the most general way in which we can parameterize wave functions with a specific symmetry as long as they're injective. Now, as we'll see next lecture, some of the most exciting wave functions don't have this structure and we don't have a theorem like that. Um, but still, uh, Like in one dimension, all these things is exactly what allows for this classification of phases, et cetera, right? Because we know exactly the, the most general way how we can represent symmetries. And that's why this is very powerful. Okay, so in the last 15, 20 minutes, let me uh, talk a bit about Hamiltonians and how this relates to injectivity. And yeah, that should kind of fit. So as I said, this really needs this injectivity in the sense that you can take a tensor and open up these four indices. It doesn't work if you have these corner effects. Because then, indeed, you have this uh, CZX state, which, this, which has this unitary symmetry, and we know that there's an MPO representation of that symmetry. And at least no factorized representation, which is actually a representation of our group. So Hamiltonians. So what is the point about parent Hamiltonians? Well, the point about parent Hamiltonians is that this is a class of Hamiltonians which we can construct for any Pep's wave function, and which will have this wave function as its exact ground state, which means we can use it, for instance, to say build some solvable model. Or, for instance, for these interpolations I mentioned earlier, where we say we try to connect a dimer model to an RBB state, we might want to say that there's also a continuous Hamiltonian for this interpolation, because then it's a physically meaningful smooth deformation, right? and we can ask is there a phase transition or not. Otherwise, we might just build something which looks smooth, but in fact it has nothing to do with a smooth, kind of slow change of parameters in the physical sense. So the point is each PEPS will have such a parent Hamiltonian, or actually many parent Hamiltonians, and it will be an exact ground state. It's kind of the opposite way of, uh, you know, usually you have some, maybe some Hamiltonian, and you use a PEPS to approximate the ground state, but you can also conversely use it to build a model, actually. So what's the idea? The idea is let's take some kind of small patch in our system, maybe two by two, two by one, whatever and ask what can we say about the possible states, so we have a big wave function. We look at a 2 by 2 patch, and we ask what can we say about the reduced density matrix. On, say, this 2 by 2 patch. Well, of course, this might be tricky because we might have to trace out everything and the structure might be complicated, but we can make some minimal statements fairly easily. Namely, whatever state appears in the reduced density matrix must be a state which we can obtain by putting some boundary condition here. Right? So this is some boundary condition, B, some vector B, which I apply. It's kind of a big tensor. It's just hard to draw, right, because it's instead distributed. So I'm just saying I take some vector B, which has eight indices, and contract it with all these eight auxiliary legs here, okay? This will give some state which is only defined on these physical indices. And this is a state which can appear in the reduced density matrix if tracing out gives rise to exactly, well, tracing out gives rise to some mixed boundary condition, right? So if this mixed boundary condition contains this, this B here, this will be a state which will appear in the reduced density matrix. So I certainly know that the reduced density matrix is indeed supported, so it's a subset of the span of all these guys, right? So rho is really supported, sorry, the support of rho is kind of contained in this type of span. Over all boundary conditions. So, so the question is what, well, what can we say? Well, we know that um, rho lives in a space which is again the total physical dimension of the system, right? So if it's an L by L block, each of the L squared. Now, this span here is, of course, cannot be bigger than the space of all possible boundary conditions I, I put, right? So the dimension of this span here 
is smaller or equal than the dimension of the boundary, which is d to the 4L. So if I look at large enough patches, I will get into a regime where this number here is larger, right? So we have a density operator which lives in a space which is larger than the largest space in which it actually is allowed to, to live, right? Because it, it must be supported in the span. Which, which implies that this guy cannot have full rank, right? So as soon as this guy is larger, we have that this reduced state cannot have full rank. Right? Is that clear? Right, so so that's, uh, the, the reduced state lives in this physical system, which has this bulk scaling, right? But the number of possible states I can get only has a boundary scaling. So at some point, I cannot get all states anymore by putting any boundary condition. So this state cannot take all possible values. There are forbidden state configurations, basically, in the reduced density matrix. So what does this mean? It means that I can write down some Hamiltonian, which is the identity minus the projector onto the support of rho, which well, is equally just a projector of the kernel of rho. So what is this? This is, this is an operator which has the following property. If I take this operator and I apply it to this Pep's wave function here, well, I know that this thing is zero on the support, right? And it's one on orthogonal states. Right, so whenever I apply to the Pep's wave function, it must be zero, because it's zero on the support of any reduced state which I could potentially get. It's also a positive semi-definite operator, right? Because it's a projection. So what it tells me is that, well, this, this wave function must be a ground state of this Hamiltonian. And now in particular, I can build this guy on all possible such blocks, sorry, sorry, take a sum over H over all two by two, overlapping two by two blocks, say, then this will have the same property, right? It will have that uh, H is positive semi-definite and H psi is zero. So we have that psi is a ground state of that guy. Now, now for now, that sounds more satisfying than it is because I could have trivially set h equal to 0, and everything would be true what I did, right? But this is not very valuable. So in some sense, what we, of course, want is not to construct an operator where this is a ground state, but to, but to construct something which has some kind of controlled structure, right? Which doesn't have an extensive ground state degeneracy, say. Which ideally has a unique ground state, or maybe in a topological case, a topological ground space degeneracy, but which behaves controlled in that way. And that's where injectivity, again, uh, enters. So, so, so maybe to put it more in words, what does this parent Hamiltonian do? This parent Hamiltonian basically ensures that, that whatever ground state I have locally looks like the right tensor network. So basically the parent Hamiltonian checks that locally on whatever small patch it acts on, there must be a way to build the state in this patch from the right tensors. It doesn't tell me that globally that's the only solution. It's like tiling problems classically, right? Just because you fix a local rule, it doesn't mean that there's only one global solution. There might be many different ones. Okay, so maybe before I, just a short remark before I, uh, try to convince you that the ground is unique once we have injectivity. Um, one great thing about the parent Hamiltonian is because you construct it like this, it will inherit all symmetries which the space has, right? So if, say, the support space, the rho, the, the, the support of rho, is SU2 invariant, it will be an SU2 invariant Hamiltonian, for instance, right? And on the other hand, of course, the, the symmetry of the support space will be inherited from the tensor, right? So if I have a tensor U, sorry, a tensor A, which whenever I apply a unitary here, it transforms nicely under this gauge. A 
and you build a Hamiltonian which kind of is exactly built from the span with all possible boundary conditions, you see that the span will also be invariant under U, right? Because you have a two by two patch of this, you apply your symmetry, then you see that this corresponds to this two by two patch, where you have moved the symmetry to the boundary as x and y. But since you allow for all boundary conditions, it just means that you get a different boundary condition, right, under the symmetry, but there is always a a boundary condition for the symmetry transformed state. So H really inherits all symmetries. Right? So if you take the AKLT model, you will get a rotation in very common. So what can we say about uniqueness? Ah, the other thing is indeed if we change our tensor continuously, as I suggested before, say to kind of a dimer model with a RDP state, then if I have a smooth A of lambda, then also I will obtain an age of lambda, which is also continuous because it's built from a finite number of objects, right? If I take four, four objects which are all continuous, analytic, whatever, and we get another object which is continuous, analytic, whatever, right? It's only the thermodynamic limit that you get phase transitions in these things, right? So indeed, any smooth interpolation of these guys locally corresponds to a smooth interpolation of Hamiltonians. Okay, very briefly, how, how does one argue about uh, uniqueness? So for uniqueness, kind of, if, if, you, if you want to understand the structure of the proof, it's more convenient to build the Hamilton slightly differently, but in the end you can convince yourself that it has the same structure. And the idea is you start from just entangled states, and you ask what's the parent Hamiltonian of this pattern of entangled states and nothing else. Because the claim was injectivity means I can make a one-to-one -one mapping between this state and whatever other injective state I have. Now, for this state, the parent Hamiltonian is very simple, right? I mean, that's an entangled state omega. So the Hamiltonian will be identity minus the projector onto omega on that link where it acts. Now, this obviously has only, if I, if I take the total Hamiltonian, it obviously has a unique ground state, right? So that's clear. Now, imagine I go from here to some general Pep's wave function where I applied some map B. <clears throat> and this P had a left inverse. Now I can basically build a new Hamiltonian from this Hamiltonian. So what we have is psi is of the form tensor product over p of omega, which is this product of these small omega states, right? Now, I can build a new Hamilton as follows. I will apply the inverse. We will see in a second why this is a good idea. So if I define a local Hamilton term like that, what I have is if I apply H prime, well, first of all, it's positive semi-definite, because I took this positive semi-definite H and I sandwiched it with some uh, something and something dagger. Well, no, I forgot the universe. So if I do this, what, what do I get? Well, I have this P inverse tends to P inverse dagger. H P inverse tends to P inverse. Tensor product over P applied to omega. Now what you see is that what happens is that these P inverses will cancel with the P's exactly where the Hamiltonian acts. Not everywhere, but where the Hamiltonian acts. What the Hamiltonian does if it acts on, uh, on omega, which it does, right, because the P's cancel at these places, it annihilates it, right? We know that H omega is zero by construction. And that's important. For this construction, you can't just shift the energy, right? It will not work. So this is zero. 
So it, it doesn't really matter we put this guy here. The reason to put it was because we wanted something Hermitian. So what we have is that this is also zero, right? So we see that basically um, we constructed a Hamiltonian which has this guy as a ground state. Now it doesn't mean that it's the only ground state. For the only ground state, we need to drive the same argument away back. Right? This was kind of saying starting from a ground state omega of h, right? This says omega of ground state of h. h prime, or more precisely, the sum over h prime, h prime. But the point is because, well, p and p inverse are kind of dual to each other, right? We can also drive the same argument backwards and say if we have some ground state here, it must correspond to a ground state there. And this is what gives us uniqueness, right? Because that's really a one-to-one -one corresponding between all states. And that's how you see that, that there are parent Hamiltonians for these guys which have unique ground states. You have to think a bit to see that this is indeed more or less the same as the construction I just described, which took the reduced density matrix, but it's pretty much the same. And well, um, if you do it formally like that, you get fairly big parent Hamiltonians, obviously, right? Because, uh, well, they, they look like two-body. They are two-body, right? They act like this. Because you start from this entangled state and then you apply the inverse map, but of course you have to block to get injective, so you derive fairly large parent Hamiltonians that way. Now, if you go into a, if you, if you do more sophisticated proofs than this one, you will get smaller patches. Namely, you need an injective block plus one side, and then if you massage things by hand, it can happen that they even become much, even smaller. So for the AKLT model, in fact, there's a two-body parent Hamiltonian. Right? The AKLT model on a honeycomb lattice. Remember what you had was spin one half singlets, and you project into a spin three half state. Um, and the point is that here, I think the dimensional counting probably fails even, right? Um, but but it, it, it happens. No, it, 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 uh, it's not injective on this block or anything like that, right? But you can define a non trivial parent Hamiltonian. And the reason is that this object is a spin zero, right? So what you have is that you have four spin one halves here, which is a maximum spin of two, but you have two spin three halves. So you could have a spin of three here, but you can't, right? Because it, you keep the spin with this map and you start from spin two at most. So you can write a Hamiltonian, which is a projector onto the spin three space on two sides. And this happens to have a unique ground state, but that's something which you don't really get from this derivation, and which is, well, at least to me, a bit of a miracle why it works. Um, yeah, like, like for these classic aesthetic models, you get five-body Hamiltonians in the simplest case. And again, it turns out they are sufficient. And the reasoning is again the same, right? If you have a, this kind of object, once you know the setting for all these four values, because it's exactly built in a way where you know amplitudes are according to StatMec weights, once you know the weight of these four guys, this is completely determined, in the superposition with the corresponding Gibbs weights. So indeed, this is a, a product state here, right? If you, think, if you freeze these, um, so so you're constrained to a subspace, right? There, there are configurations which are ruled out, and you can write a Hamiltonian. Turns out that this is sufficient again. Anyway, I think it's a, yes. Good time to stop and move to questions. Yes. What's the meaning of the parent Hamiltonian for such as for the using curves for aesthetics? It's a Hamiltonian which has this as a unique ground state in the finite volume. I should indeed say we, we know for the Ising there's a kind of phase transition, right? There's a regime where this Ising type uh, Pep's wave function has some kind of long range order or symmetry break, and indeed something goes wrong with the Hamiltonian there. Um, in some sense, the same happens if you take an actual proper 2D Ising Hamiltonian with transverse feed, say, which is not the same Hamiltonian, right? Um, you have an exponentially small splitting, and this is about exact zero energy ground state. It didn't make any signal about gaps. Gaps are tricky, we know they're tricky, right? You cannot expect that Pep suddenly solve all gap problems. Um, that's when you may have better shoot numerics and say, check if you slowly interpolate that Hamiltonian, you check the ground state wave function, you check if it has a divergent correlation length, for instance. Um, but in, in, in the limit where you're kind of uh, at high temperature, the parent <coughs> Hamilton is kind of very close to the Ising model with a magnetic field. In the other regime, it's very different. For instance, you can see that if you, if you take the limit where you go to zero temperature, you would expect to have a pure Ising model without field, but you don't because actually if say this spin is zero, this spin is zero, 
this spin is 1 and this spin is 1, then a possible ground state, this shouldn't be part of the ground space in any case for a, like Isaac type Hamiltonian. But in this case, it will allow you, it will tell you that this should be in a plus state, right? Because the Gibbs weight is completely equal for this one up and down. It's equally unfavorable in principle. But the Hamiltonian doesn't care about the fact that it's actually unfavorable. Just locally, they have the same statistical weight in the limit. So that's not really what you want for kind of an isoferromagnet. So indeed, the suspicion is that after the phase transition, these parent Hamiltons are not very natural anymore. What is the relation uh, between this parent Hamiltonian and the stochastic Hamiltonian that gives you sort of all the stuff? Uh, well, well, for the Ising model, this should exactly be, in fact, the, the pretty much one-to-one -one related to the global dynamics. So you can re-express this Hamiltonian as the stochastic evolution, which is the metropolis evolution for the Ising model. So it should have the same, say, spectral properties, right? Is there a construction where you can show this? Uh, in the paper of Frank, there is maybe one sentence about it or one paragraph, I'm not sure. It's explained. Uh, according to Frank, it's, it's explained. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> It's this uh, criticality, the area law, and the computational power of PEPS paper or so. Well, why don't we introduce this side? Uh huh. So, 2006 PIL. Yeah. But indeed, I mean, it's certainly mentioned there. I think it's even explained there, indeed. There is a more than one paragraph discussion, I think, of this relation. But I don't think it's so hard to see, right? Because indeed, what you want is that the Hamilton exactly gives you weights which correspond to the, the Gibbs weights. Which is, of course, also what metropolis sampling does, more or less. Right? Well, but that's, that's not the same. You have to do a semantic process. Yeah, yeah, of course, the stochastic process is not, it's not, it's not a mission, right? It's a but, but if it's detailed balanced, then there is, exists a semantic right. approximation that makes it a mission. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the mapping. But I mean, that, that's how the cross sections of all these modes. So you have a stochastic mode. So, so something that has obvious detailed balance is, by definition, uh, by semantic transformation, transferable to a Hamiltonian problem. Okay, uh, as I said, I will finish here, and uh, if there are questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. <laughs>